everyone. Could I welcome you all to today's meeting of the Public Petitions Committee? And as normal, could I ask everyone to switch off any mobile phones or electronic devices as they interfere with our sound system. Um, first of all, can I put on record there's apologies from John Wilson. Uh, I, agenda item one, decision on taking business in private. The first item of business seeks the committee's agreement to take item four in private. Is the committee agreed that this item should be taken in private? Agreed. Thank you. Um, agenda item two, consideration of new petitions. The next item of business is consideration of new petitions. There is one new petition for consideration today, and it's PE 1463 by Sandra White, Marion uh, Diver and Lorraine Cleaver on effective thyroid and adrenal testing, diagnosis and treatment. Members have a note by the clerk, the spice briefing and the petition. Could I welcome both our petitioners today? Thank you very much for coming along to the Parliament. I know it's probably been quite difficult for you to travel today. It's not a very a nice day at all. So thanks so much for coming along. Um, I'd like to thank uh, both of you for attending and ask Sandra White if she would perhaps make a brief presentation of around five minutes. Afterwards, uh, I'll start with some questions, then I'll pass over to my colleagues. But we're very grateful for both of you for giving up your time to come in today. Sandra White. Convener, members of the committee, thank, thank you for bringing us along here today. I'll tell you what, we're very, very proud to be Scottish today, to show that this is the way it's done. Because there's many thousands out there of agencies that are trying to get this across to Parliament, to try and do something about it. So we're speaking for them. Me, personally, I've had a total nightmare trying to get a diagnosis within the NHS. 14 years before I got a diagnosis of excruciating pain, uh, so much so that they sent me down the lines of um, multiple sclerosis. Um, and they actually did a muscle test on me for mus muscular dystrophy. I was that disabled. And I was going into unconsciousness three, four times a day. And it ended up um, an emergency because I was dying. And I couldn't get a pulse. I was great, my lips were blue, and went to hospital, and they did, they got me round, but I was sent out without a diagnosis. And the doctors out there are seeing this all the time, and they're frustrated. It's not fair on our doctors what's happening, because they want to help us. And there's not the testing out there, there's not the treatment for this condition that we are particularly speaking about today, which is um, a conversion failure of the inactive T3 thyroid hormone being able to cross over into the active T3 hormone. That actually doesn't happen in the thyroid's gland at all. And the, the guidance notes by the, the Royal College of Physicians just seems to, to cover um, people that can convert normally. And yeah, we agree with that. Levothyroxine is the right treatment for those people that are normally converting. We don't, and we're stuck in this no man's land, not being able to, to get a diagnosis. Um, we really do need to give the doctors much more autonomy on this to be able to let them do the proper testing. The testing is out there, but not in the NHS. And we had to get private testing done, which showed it up straight away. Um, after 14 years, uh, this miracle doctor just said, this is what's wrong with you, Sandra. And I got, the, I got the T3 tablets. Within two weeks, my pain had gone. And I went back to the doctors and I asked them to do a muscle enzyme test on me, which had been raised for 10 years. And my cholesterol, which was sky high, both of them were back to normal within two months. And yet they are not giving us this treatment. And there's thousands out there. And I think we're asking for guidelines to be put for this specific condition, the non-conversion. We need to have our adrenals working properly for that conversion as well. So that adrenal testing should be done as well before, before they even do give you levothyroxine, they should be checking your adrenals. Because you need to have enough cortisol from the adrenals to be able to put that um, conversion across. Now that conversion happens within the peripheral of the body, the liver and the gut, not in the thyroid. So by definition, primary hypothyroidism is a problem within the thyroid gland. This is not within the thyroid gland, although it's a, a hormone from 
it comes inactive from the thyroid gland. But it's, a, it's done through a thing called diadenase. And if you've got failure of that for any kind, which could be you've got low adrenals, it's not going to happen. And the simple things like doctors see the signs. We were actually telling them what was wrong. We were saying, I've got something wrong with my metabolism. I'm not getting anything from my food. I'm not getting any energy from my food. I feel like I can't breathe. We were telling them what was wrong. And, that, you know, that, that, they're, the, they're the symptoms. So if doctors are trained in this area in particular, the knock-on effect of not being diagnosed, it goes on to so many other conditions, and it's costing the NHS, I'm not talking millions, I'm talking billions, because we're, we're talking fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, um, the pain that goes with it. We watched um, a debate here just at the beginning of January, a lady with chronic pain, and the amount of money that's spent on that. Um, how many of them are actually getting a metabolic test just to see if this is what the problem is? Because the test that they're doing at the moment is just coming back. We can look normal in the TSH T4 test. We can look normal. So we have to have another test done for the peripheral level to see if it's going into the cells, for it to work to give us energy. Lorraine, would you like to say anything? Well, I'll just briefly then. Um, I would just like to say that I'm considered a success story. I had my thyroid removed on advice from endocrinologists um, with the assurance that they would replace the hormones that my thyroid no longer could make. That didn't happen. Um, I was given the standard T4, couldn't convert it. Um, but when I said all these symptoms, severe illness, I was told it was in my mind, it was anxiety, I had fibromyalgia, um, I nearly lost my marriage. Uh, 12 months ago I was about to commit suicide, but I have a little boy and a husband. If it wasn't for a charity, I wouldn't have been here because Thyroid UK put me in touch with a humane doctor who saved my life. I just want to finish by saying there are 82 medicines for type 2 diabetes available on the NHS list, 47 for depression, 45 for acne, 16 for athlete's foot, 3 for hiccups, 3 for dandruff, and 1 for thyroid. There's something very wrong. Thank you. Thanks. Well, th thank you uh, very much for, uh, really, first of all, raising awareness to the committee um, of this uh, real difficulty that both of you have experienced. And I think Lorraine's story was one that captured the imagination, I'm sure, of the committee and wider field as well. Uh, the, I, I'm certainly convinced with the story you've been telling um, the committee today. But I suppose the wider issue is, can you point to some evidence that there is a real problem with the way GPs are behaving towards this particular issue in a wider sense, because clearly that's the issue that government's going to throw back to us. So we would like to do some spade work on this issue uh, as we pursue the petition through the next steps. I think it's in their training. It starts in the training. Um, and they're frustrated by this. It, you know, we've gone for help after our diagnosis and they've said, our hands are tied. They are so frustrated that they can't help us. So Can if, I interrupt? So I think because you're asking for specific... Um, there are no guidelines. There are no guidelines in Scotland for the treatment or diagnosis of hypothyroidism. Everybody refers to the Royal College of Physicians policy document, but that was never um, requested by the Department of Health. That is just their own policy document. And ultimately, the RCP are a charity. So because of the lack of guidelines, GPs are cribbing together from this, and, and that's what they're based on. So in these guidelines, they don't provide for people like us who will not convert. convert. There's no mention of that in, in the primary hypothyroidism, the, the, the guidance notes from the Royal College of Physicians. And you'll notice that they've actually um, 
called it the diagnosis and management of primary hypothyroidism, nothing about conversion failure. And I think if we could get guidelines for that specific area as well, and, and taking into account the adrenal problem, um, that would open up the whole thing. So yeah. The issue then is, uh, is in the wider sense is about procedures, because normally there would be assigned guidance, wouldn't there, to direct doctors on how to deal with different diseases. They wouldn't be, if, if they then gave the, the treatment, they wouldn't, they don't, they feel restrained at the moment because if they help us, they get dragged up in front of the, the Royal College of Physicians and it's a nightmare. And they're the people that want to help us. The one that helped me and saved my life had that battle a number of years ago. And uh, after 14 years, within five minutes, he knew what was wrong with me. And to me, that man deserves a, a knighthood, never mind getting struck off. Or he actually wasn't struck off. He ended up re retiring from it because he wanted to help people. I think one of the uh, positive things about this committee, although I would say that, wouldn't I, is the fact that we could focus in uh, on particular, particularly recently more medical issues, such as the pain relief you mentioned, uh, and I'll say a little bit about this later, but we've had uh, a number of successes recently, and I'm going to mention thanks to Alec Neil particularly for managing to achieve a number of uh, solutions to problems that petitioners have raised with us. So clearly in the past I think there's been three or four good examples where I think the petitions committee has worked extremely well. So I'll now pass over to my colleagues and start with Anne McTaggart. Good morning. Thanks, convener, and good morning, Sandra and Lorraine, and thank you very much for your opening comments. Um, just taking up from the question that you've just answered, could I possibly ask you to look at to describe to us what evidence that that you have had, um, that you have collated from perhaps the UK or even further afield? Well, we've been in touch with um, re uh, world renowned, and they are even quite willing to come to Scotland, to, to, and they've got an abundance of proof. There's um, one man in particular, Dr. Linder, who's got so much evidence um, together on his site alone to prove the point. And the, all the different conditions, if this is not treated, what it goes on to. So that in a, alone is, um, it, it's out there. The proof is out there in abundance. Where did you see that that physician? Dr. Called? Lindner. It's um, hormone restoration in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, another big question, sorry, convener. Um, really, could you elaborate on what communication that you've had with both Scottish Government and yes. Westminster um, Government as well? Elaine Smith has been wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Yes, she debated it and uh, basically that's why we got in touch with her originally because it was, um, she asked uh, um, Anthony Toft and we could not believe that we were seeing this in print that he was actually saying that doctors need to take a whole approach to this and look at signs and symptoms, that there is a conversion failure. And that inspired us to do what we're doing today. So Elaine, brilliant. She's Thank very passionate Thank you for doing what you're it. doing today. It's great to see you yeah. along here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Kabir. Thank you. Uh, Chick Brody. Thank you, good morning. And uh, I add my welcome to that. Can I just dwell for a minute on, I, I hear what you say about the doctors, but the, the dilemma I have is, is our doctors in general, I know you have specifics, but uh, following through in terms of the T4 to T3, you know, at what stage do they uh, make a decision that clinically they have to go further? I mean, are they really trained sufficiently? Do, can, do they recognise the symptoms? Of course. Um, I'd like to say first, before I answer you, that this is not a gripe about the NHS. All my treatment was private. Obviously, I started at the GP, but then, you know, from there on after. It's not the NHS because it's the training that comes from the RCP down and filters down. Their hands are tied. Um, do you want to...? Well, it's a delicate area, really, but the whole system he's looking at, to be perfectly honest, right back to the source. Um, why are we keeping people ill? Simple, simple question. Why are we keeping people ill? 14 years, you know, and I'm not the only one. There's so many out there. 
that are getting treatment for different conditions that's actually not the condition because doctors haven't given them a diagnosis. But you're getting an antidepressant. Antidepressants are going out there great guns because they don't know what else to put this down to. The problems have really ramped up since the introduction of the TSH test as the gold standard for diagnosing thyroid disease. And since that's been the standard since the 70s, we've had two new diseases. We've had fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. Just a couple of years after the insistence on a TSH test. So wherever you fall in the parameters that some lab has set, and they change from city to city. They're, you're, not, they're it, actually denying us of all the hormones. I can't take T4. I have like a... a an, no, an, I, I understand that. The yeah. difficulty I have, it, it, and it's not a difficulty, I mean, clearly it's something that we, has to be uh, resolved, is, is in the paper, they said that the, the RCP, the College of Physicians, uh, stated that patients with continuing symptoms after appropriate thyroxine treatment should be further investigated to diagnose and treat the cause. Why isn't that happening? We're given antidepressants sent for cognitive behavioural therapy. But told told it's in somatoform head. in your head. But so I you're saying the diagnostic process is not being followed? Absolutely. I had fibromyalgia, allegedly. I had a walking stick. I was 13 stone last year. I was wearing a wig. I had high cholesterol. I was ready to take my life. You know, I don't have any of those problems now. My new problem is that the doctor who saved my life, the GMC, are intent on re-registering them, you know. So where will I source the pig thyroid that keeps me alive? I think the point reference to individual doctors, let me, let me just ask one more question, if I may, Camina. How often are uh, patients referred to endocrinologists? Uh, and can the endocrinologist prescribe a wider treatments? They can prescribe T3. They can. Um, Why isn't this happening? Don't know. Uh, probably because GPs are not seeing the signs in the first place. Some of the symptoms are really weird. I mean, you would laugh at some of the symptoms, but they're not funny. Uh, luckily, my friend Marion, who can't be here today because she is too ill, we've both been given diagnostic proof that we had, well, I'm, I'm on treatment myself because I, I source it, from um, a private test that tells us we, had adrenal, we have adrenal exhaustion. We took it to the doctors and he said we can't prescribe you the treatment for that. Doctors are trying to think, seeming to think that the hydrocortisone treatment that you get for adrenal insufficiency or adren just deficiency, slight deficiency, they're thinking it's a drug. It's not. It's a replacement hormone. And they need to start thinking that they are replacing your hormone. The, the, the T4 is denying us of T3, T2, T1 and calcitonin. Now, just them alone is causing all sorts of hassle. T3 is the active one. T2 actually um, helps control going over from T4 to T3 and sends messages to the brain as T1. They're finding out more all the time the, the, the references are out there. One last question. Sure. Just, just let's think just outside the box. Are there any recommended homeopathic cures for this? Uh, no. no. They, they, when we go to holistic people, they, they basically will uh, replacement hormones. And there are bioidentical uh, bio uh, bio -identical treatment out there that can uh, be sufficient. But um, doctors are of the opinion that they're quacks, basically. But, but we are um, we're being cured and we're proof. Um, I'm just so grateful to be alive, and so is Lorraine, and Marion is in a mess, to be honest. I mean, we're not taking... It's not anything out there. I'm taking porcine thyroid, which is from a pig, but that was in common use up until the 60s, late 50s. So um, if you can't tolerate something that the one and only medication that seems to be available. If you can't tolerate it and you read the patient leaflet and you have every reaction that's on that side effect label, you go to the endo, the endocrinologist, and you tell them, they said to me, it's not thyroid related, that's something else. So where do you go with an attitude like that? There's none as blind as those that won't see. So that is costing, the NHS can't afford these tests that we're asking. 
we're aware that that will get thrown up. That's a possibility. But the NHS can't afford not to do them because, OK, I was seen privately, but had it been within the system and Marion was there, she's had muscle biopsies, MRI Sorry, scans. Uh, sorry, Sandra. The money we must be costing the NHS is mind-boggling. Thank you. Angus MacDonald. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Sandra. Good morning, Lorraine. Um, you've uh, raised some, some valid points this morning, um, which uh, we'll cl clearly be taking on board. Um, it's also clear that you've done a considerable degree of research, uh, and, and well done for that. Um, according to the, the briefings that we've received, um, the Royal College of Physicians doesn't support the use of thyroid extracts or levothyroxine uh, and T3 combinations without further validation research. And we've heard from you uh, this morning uh, that you've got a fairly negative view, I think it's fair to say, of the Royal College of, of Physicians. Uh, I also note that you mentioned in your submission uh, a recent Swedish study uh, which states that 70% of patients are not symptom-free on T4 only. Uh, so as a follow-up to Anne McTaggart's uh, earlier point, uh, given the issue is being looked at in other countries, uh, are there any other European countries that have taken the action that you're proposing or that you'd like to see uh, taken in Scotland um, with regard to uh, accurately diagnosing um, and treating thyroid and adrenal uh, NHS systems, or there's... Yeah. No, that's why I'm proud to be Scottish. OK. So so you, you have no this, example... This is the furthest anyone has got. OK. They're All making right. changes, in, slowly but surely, in the States. You know, they are beginning to address. The, their reference range, that where you fall in, you get a diagnosis. They've narrowed that, and they are looking again at it. But, you know, on... Um, Let's, we're all connected with social media now. We're beginning to find out across the world that this is endemic. I met Sandra for the first time last night. I feel like I've known her all my life, but we, we, we're having to come together and we're speaking with people in the States who are horrified at what they're finding out. Um, this was Thyroid Awareness Month last month, and the American Association of Endocrinologists had a website. The comments on that are astonishing, but they are beginning to listen, but it's it'll be too late for well, another, our lifetime. Another agency that we got in touch with, um, Thyroid Change, they're um, in contact with 125 different countries. So that'll give you some idea about this is an epidemic, and purely because they are just seeing what you've just said is their preferred treatment is T4 only. Um, if we took T4 only, we'd go in eventually, um, get toxic, and go, in, go into a Addisonian crisis, basically. And you can die from it, simple as, because you're not converting. The, the natural that you're talking about is perfect for the likes of yourself, Lorraine, who gets the thyroid taken out, and they're not converting. That's giving back all the hormones that we need to stay alive. And, that, and cortisol... If your adrenals um, fail on you, that's Addison's disease. Now, Addison's disease is starting to get more awareness now, but there was a few years ago, w members of my own family had problems, and when they were taken into hospital in an Addisonian crisis, they were told they were having a panic attack. Horrendous treatment, um, and he went years without the, the proper fluid cortisone, which is supposed to go with it, and after about... 20 years, he, he then found out that he wasn't getting another um, hormone, which is called DHEA, which is made in the adrenals as well, crucial for to work alongside it. So he asked the, the endocrinologist and the doctor if he could get a prescription for it. We don't prescribe it. They do not prescribe DHEA when your adrenals are failed, have failed. The research is coming through from people in this country uh, questioning the accuracy of a TSH test. There's, I have papers here from uh, John Midgley in Yorkshire. He's a clinical biochemist. And this latest paper in just in January, which was just published two weeks ago, is, is pituitary TSH an adequate measure of thyroid hormone-controlled homeostasis during thyroid treatment? Basically, thyroxine can make the blood look great but it doesn't show what's going on inside your cells. So, so they're coming up normal. 
the bloods look great. And that's all that's great. But the evidence is coming through. Okay, but um, to get back to the, the, the original question, um, as far as you're aware, uh, there's, there's no, no other country uh, ahead of us, basically. There's, there's still... As far as I'm aware, no. They're watching this in America right now with interest. Okay, right, thanks. Just on the back of Anx Madon's um, question, um, have you had any correspondence with the World Health Organisation? Because obviously that's their role to look at coordination of health initiatives across the globe. <coughs> no. Uh, no. Um, I noticed that in 2008, the Chief Medical Officer for Scotland launched um, a three-year-long long-term conditions collaborative. I don't know what the outcome of that was, but I do know that every long-term alliance that I've looked at, every chronic condition alliance in Scotland that I've looked at, not one of them mentions hypothyroidism or thyroid disease, but it's up there with diabetes. Yeah. Well, if the committee are so minded, it might be useful for us to contact them ourselves to get some response. Uh, Adam Ingram? Yeah, I'm just uh, curious as to uh, the prevalence of, you, you mentioned obviously um, there is increasing awareness across the world about um, this particular uh, condition. Uh, we have a note here that suggests that something like 103,000 people in Scotland um, are diagnosed with uh, hypothyroidism. I take it the, the condition varies from individual to individual. Um, so um, could, can you give me, just flesh out a little bit uh, yeah, that's about... That's why we're asking for them to be targeted to the individual, the, the medication for the individual. We're all different with what our chemical up build, uh, build up is. So we've all got to adjust differently to, to what our chemistry is. And that's what the test we're asking for. There's a fantastic test, which is a metabolic analysis test, which covers the whole, the whole spectrum. You know, and, and uh, sorry, what was the other, the, the beginning? You said about 103 in Scotland, wasn't it? 3,000, right. People who are uh, diagnosed. They're lucky, that. they're yeah. lucky. And if they're on level thyroxine and they are converting the thyroid hormone, excellent. They're on the right treatment with level thyroxine. We don't have a problem with that and we don't have a problem with the guideline regarding that. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm saying there's another problem here that we need to address, which is the failure of that. Well, what I was trying to tease out was uh, um, numbers, I suppose, a, a proportion of, of people who are uh, diagnosed with hypothyroidism. How many of them have the, the problem that you've described? Well, I see. Um, I spoke with my endocrinologist on Friday, who is an NHS endocrinologist, and he said that he obviously just gets sent the people who still have the problems. Um, everybody else is at home doing great. So he possibly sees 20% of the people that are diagnosed. That's what he said. About 20% of people have problems and still have symptoms. And he prescribes, on occasion, T3. But he's also told me he feels hamstrung. You know, he feels that it's still frowned upon to give T3 to these people. But... He's frustrated that he can't make his patients well. My response to that is, you're seeing 20% of people who are questioning things the way that I did, because I believe for six years what they told me, which is, you've got high blood pressure, you need to lose weight, you're depressed, you've got fibromyalgia. So if you're believing these tags, you're never going to push to see an endocrinologist and to get help. And, and work out that it's not the TB, T4 that's converting. You're not going to know. So there's 20% getting sent to endocrinologists, 20% of 103,000. It's not a lot. But that's the people that are, A, lucky enough to be diagnosed in the first place and fit into this little TSH parameter. And it's also the people that have said, no, I'm sorry. I don't have fibromyalgia. I don't have lasiitis. 20,000 is quite a lot if you're talking about 20% uh, of 100,000. Well, yeah, and I said, why is that acceptable? What, that this test uh, misses so many people and it, it comes down to money. Well, 
The other, the other question I was going to ask, both of, both of you alluded to uh, doctors who were trying to uh, provide a solution to you getting in trouble with their uh, professional bodies. Uh, on what basis are they getting in trouble with their professional bodies? It tends not to be the patients that make the, the complaints. It tends to be other doctors that make the complaints against them. Well, my own person, my doctor, Dr Skinner, um, from, and he's a Scottish doctor, he's not an endocrinologist. He started out as a virologist, but he, has, he restores people to health because he says, I'm doctoring, I will treat you by your symptoms first and foremost, because the blood test doesn't always accurately show what's wrong. Do you know, we're getting that good at this now. We can spot people ourselves. <laughs> I met my sister for Sorry, the first right, time. Just, just One just technical sorry. point: um, it's probably best we don't name individual doctors. It just okay. no, no. The, oh, yeah. right, sorry, Thank sorry. You. I'm saying I met my sister 25 years. She's been in New Zealand, and I hadn't met her until this summer. And as soon as I opened the door, I thought, "You've got a conversion problem." <laughs> and she has. She went back. To, she got the test done. She went back to New Zealand, and all her life she's been ill, and on levothyroxine, and she was toxic. And now she's on T3 only, and fantastic. Just on that last point, I mean, it's not the question I want to ask, but does that suggest there's a, a genetic uh, yes. disorder? Yes, there is, as, there is as well. They've proven that. And uh, they've actually proven that there's a, a gene that they've found, um, a default in the diadenes that can cause a wee bit of a problem as well. So there's quite a few references to it in different books. Mark Starr reference, uh, refers to it as well in his book. So there's, there's, there's evidence out there that, yes, it can be that as well. So there's quite a wide range of reasons for it. Okay, the question I was going to ask is on the basis of the 20,000 that my colleague Adam Ingram mentioned uh, and the research you've done, and this is probably an unfair question, particularly, Lorraine, on the basis that you've been private, is there any prevalence in any part of Scotland, in any particular health board, where the diagnosis is not being done effectively? Or is there one, let's be positive, is there any one health board where it is being done effectively? Well, the doctor that, that tried to help me and say that I was a genuine soul and that I wasn't, uh, it wasn't in my head, I met him about three months ago and I told him what was actually wrong with me 14 years ago and he said, oh! Well, the TSH test wouldn't have been any good to you. And I went, I don't believe you've just said that. No, that's my question. I understand that. So I'm but saying, please there... send them to him well, in, in the yeah. lab area. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you'd be delighted. <laughs> um, but is there any evidence that one health board or two health boards or three health boards are being more effective in addressing this issue and others. If there's not, please say so. There's no evidence that we could find, and we, sh we couldn't believe how little statistical data there was on this illness, considering it's, you know, 10 to 1, 10 women in, for one man. It's a common, common condition. And so often people think it's so easily treated, you just take one little thyroid pill a day, and so it's, it's garnered that reputation, which is unfair, because the British Thyroid Foundation opened their paper with hypothyroidism is an insidious condition with a significant morbidity and the subtle signs and symptoms may be attributed mistakenly to other illnesses. It's ten times more common in women. There's no, there's no reason for it to be missed. Yeah, really, I think that's just been answered. One of my questions was gender specific, but obviously you're saying it's ten to one. Right, thank you. Hormonal, so women tend to have the hormonal burden with pregnancy. Can I, can, you know, can I ask? Can I just say something? Um, childhood sexual abuse, uh, horrendous, but that child cause it being stressed all the time produces cortisol all the time, and eventually that situation that they're in um, knocks the thyroid out and stops this conversion problem. Um, and then the, the post-traumatic stress kicks in and it, it follows on throughout your life. So, you know, children that are, are even people that are in war zones that have post-traumatic stress syndrome, 
this system should be looked at for them to be helped. Does any other member wish to ask a question or point? Um, well, can I thank both uh, witnesses um, for coming along today? Although at one level it's quite a technical debate, um, I think you've raised awareness of the committee about uh, the massive problems that this uh, difficulty causes. Uh, my, my view is certainly we need to continue this petition, this petition and do a bit more work. Uh, one suggestion, I think, obviously we'd normally write to the Scottish Government, but perhaps it might be useful to write to them and ask that some sort of working group set up to look and do a bit more spade work into this yeah. particular issue, because I think Lorraine's point was that there's hardly any statistics on it is quite, is quite worrying. Um, the clerks also suggested some other areas we can look at, such as writing to the GMC, the Royal College of Physicians, and Thyroid UK. And my point earlier, we don't normally write to the World Health Organization, but I was quite concerned about the number of countries involved here. There must be some overall work done by the by World Health Organization. Um, can I ask uh, Angus MacDonald? Thanks, Convener. I'm, I'm just wondering if, in addition to uh, writing to uh, the ones you mentioned, perhaps we should write to the Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network, um, who are the body responsible for publishing criminal, uh, sorry, clinical <laughs> guidelines for the NHS in Scotland. Um, so I, I don't know if you feel that would be appropriate or not. Certainly. Sure. No, no, I agree. I, just, uh, uh, I think um, we, we Jackson should. Jackson um, I'm slightly concerned in that when we write, we need to frame the question that we put quite carefully because from everything we've heard and seen, there's not much to be served by them writing back to us telling us they don't really recognise the condition or they don't have systems for it, whatever else. I think part of our questioning should be framed on why has their approach, as we understand it, to this been as it is and what do they intend to do about it? I also think it would be interesting, if possible, to write to the authors of the Swedish study yeah. uh, to see, because I think what we are doing is we are writing to people who at the moment don't seem to be very proactive on the matter. Um, I, I don't know whether beyond the Swedish study there is anywhere you could point us to where there is an international awareness or specialisation to whom we could maybe write for some evidence, because I suspect, as I say, what we're going to get back from the organisations we would normally write to is several kind of, we're not very enthusiastic or there's a lot more needs to be understood or done before we do anything. Uh, and as I say, I don't think that advances as much. You also mentioned there was some best practice in, the, in America. What was that study? Or can you perhaps let, let us know after the, the meeting? Yeah, yeah, we can. And, you know, the top, the top people are quite willing to, to speak to the parliament. Thyroid UK definitely have. I was just going to say th Thyroid UK. I've got Thyroid UK, their advisors on Thyroid UK are wonderful, so please get in touch with them. We had we mentioned that, yeah. that earlier. Can I ask something of yes, the committee? Sure. Um, it's my belief that the Scottish Health and National Health Service in Scotland has always been separate, always been devolved. This has nothing to do with devolution in 1999, is it? We've always been our own health service. I saw a debate in here, the lady with about congenital heart defects, and her problem was they kept waiting on updated, revised guidance from England. I wonder why that's the status quo. Why, why, when we're a separate devolved health authority, we mimic or wait for English guidelines? There's, there's a long and short answer to that, but the, I mean, the, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence are the the body that uh, we tend to look at when it comes to approval of new drugs. Uh, but obviously in Scotland we have the Scottish Medical uh, Consortium, which does that job as well. But clearly if work has been done on a new pain relief drug, for example, and NICE has approved it, clearly it's sensible to listen. Uh, and in a sense, NICE are a UK body. Uh, so we, like education, we've had a strong track record of having initiatives in Scotland long before devolution. Um, but, but, you know, you're right to say there was elements of devolution long before this parliament was set up. Um, but that doesn't mean that you know our best practice when organisations like NICE come up and, and make some recommendations. Well, it says something when they don't even have any guidelines. Because I emailed NICE and, and they said NICE yeah. has not yet been asked to produce guidance on this topic. Topics for the NICE work programme are referred to NICE by the Department of Health in line with the national priorities. Yes. So that's the Department of Health in England's national priorities. Well, we'll hopefully we'll get some answers to you from we write to all these various other organisations. So clearly we'll keep you up to date with this. It's a very important petition. 
And I know it's difficult coming before the Parliament, so thank both of you for giving up your time and coming in today. It's been very educational for the whole committee, and we'll certainly be pursuing the points uh, in line with the points that all my colleagues have made earlier. So thanks again for coming along, and I'll suspend for one minute to allow our witnesses to leave. Thank, thank you both. You. The committee. Um, we are now on agenda item three, consideration of current petitions. The next item of business is consideration of current petitions. There are seven current petitions for consideration today. The first current petition is PE1285 by Caroline Mockford and free calls to NHS24 for mobile phones, members of a note by the clerk and the submissions. Um, I'm sure members might wish to, wish to comment on this. Um, but you, you will all know, I'm sure, that the government has agreed that the 111 calls for non-emergencies uh, will be effective from April 2014. Um, in that light, I would recommend to the committee that we close this very, very good petition. But I would like to say a wider issue um, that I think we should draw attention to the positive impact that our petition system in the Scottish Parliament are having on the lives of people across Scotland. I say this following a series of commitments announced by the Scottish Government response to calls for action in three different health-related petitions that we've had before us. Uh, this was one, of course. The other ones, as members will know, was a specialist drug for cystic fibrosis and the report that a residential pain service was to be established in Scotland. These were all initiatives which uh, ordinary members of the public took before us. I think the committee spent a lot of time and effort in these, and in all these areas we've achieved success. Now, we don't, of course, uh, can't achieve this on every occasion, uh, but I would just want to put on record my thanks to the committee and the petitioners for raising awareness of these issues um, and my thanks to the Health Minister for achieving success on these various yeah, initiatives. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I would like formally to thank the petitioner for raising this issue um, and to recommend that we now close the petition because the aim has been achieved. Are yeah, members yeah. agreeable? Thank you for that. Um, the, 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 the second current petition before us today is PE 1395 by Jan Kulik on target funding for lesser taught languages and cultures at universities. Members have a note by the clerk and the submissions. And before I invite contributions from members, um, members will know this is, again has been a very effective uh, petition. Um, we've raised this on a number of occasions. The last one was the Scottish Funding Council. Uh, but I thought it was quite interesting in the note back from the Scottish Funding Council um, and indeed from the petitioner. Um, it's probably a truism to say that students can't apply for courses that are actually not on offer. Um, and how, in the general sense, can universities assess untapped demand when there's no mechanism in, to do that? Um, although we've had this before us a number of times, the petition does suggest that we do, and, and indeed Scottish Funding Council suggests that we actually write, perhaps finally, to the University of Glasgow to try and get some answer to that question, because it is a very interesting question. Um, and we all know there's difficulties with resources, but I just feel it's important we try and get to the bottom of this particular issue. Okay. Do members, other members wish to? Yeah. So we will be writing then to the University of Glasgow in the terms of the questions that I put earlier to try and determine and answer that specific point, because I think this is a, a very important petition. And as you know, we had a good turnout um, from the petitioners and students, I think, to raise awareness on that issue. I just think, uh, I'm not sure Trip, whether should have, sorry, give me a, um, clearly one of the important things that, that you know, we have to do is be able to, you know, we we're talking about our selling abroad and exporting, that, that uh, one thing that is lacking is uh, our ability to communicate mm. effectively in, in the uh, technical and commercial marketplace. Mm. Uh, so I, I think it is right that we also raise that as a concern when we write to the university. Mm. I don't want to extend this argument too much, but on a, and I'm, so before I raise a personal point, but um, um, on, when I was in Taiwan recently, I was speaking to students in universities there, and they say that 
that's, that's, they want students from Taiwan to study in the UK, but Scotland isn't getting its fair share of students. So in one sense, there actually is a demand there, and it's maybe about how do universities actually sell effectively what they do, their product and their courses, both in the UK and, and abroad. Adam Ingram, you've got certain experience from your, your past in this area. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, um, I do think we have uh, a deficiency in our... Uh, our language expertise and it doesn't appear to be we don't appear to be catching up on it the, the, the issue I was going to flag up was as well as writing to Glasgow University should we not be writing to University yeah. of Scotland um, to get their uh, perspective the, the yeah. that's a good point. members agreeable with that or members of any other suggestions for action yeah. right, thank you for that we'll write to uh, University of Glasgow and University of Scotland um, the third competition is PE 1400 by Libby Anderson on behalf of One Kind on a ban on the use of wild animals in circuses. Members have a note by the clerk and submissions. Um, I think members will have noted the point by Libby Anderson that in England there's a change to regulations which would ban uh, wild animals in circuses and there's a concern that there could be uh, a move from circuses from England to Scotland because of that. I think that's summarising Libby Anderson's point reason reasonably well. Um, I think it probably would be sensible if we consider this again after these two recess, by which time hopefully we've got an answer from the Scottish Government on what programme they're doing. In fairness, the Scottish Government does appear very sympathetic to this point, so I don't think this is a huge, going to be a huge problem, but uh, I'd rather get something in black and white from the Scottish Government. Okay. Members agreeable? Thank you. Um, fourth current petition is PE 1432 by Joseph Duncalf and Antony Duncalf on improving emergency ambulance provision in remote and rural areas. Uh, members have a note by the clerk and the submissions. Again, this has been a very useful um, petition. It does appear to me that we've now satisfied the objective of the petition, and I would suggest yep. that we now close the petition because of the work carried out by the Scottish Ambulance Service. Great. Um, the fifth current petition is PE 1443 by Maureen Sharkley on behalf of the Scottish Care and Information on Miscarriage on investigating the causes of miscarriage. Members of a note by the clerk and submissions can write contributions from members. And I would just highlight, I think, that um, there's still two substantial uh, bits of evidence that we don't have back from the BMA and the, and the Tommy organisation. Um, will members be agreeable that we we'll wait until yeah, we get these? I'm the target. Thanks, convener. I was really quite saddened to hear that we haven't. We're still awaiting um, those two. Would it be possible for us just to continue that until we do hear hear back from them? I'm happy with that. Approach. To ensure we give it a fair hearing. That's great. Thank you for that. We'll continue until we. When did we actually? Was the actual date of writing to? I can't remember. I know that we met and discussed this in November. Would have been just shortly after, yes, just shortly after a meeting in November. I just wonder if we can encourage some of these associations to understand okay. who we're asking these questions on behalf of and that yeah. they should be a mm -hmm. bit more expeditious in responding mm -hmm. to them. Yeah. I have members be aware that we raised this at the last meeting and it was agreed I would raise this at the conveners group yeah. um, and to find out whether there's an issue across the board with other committees. But I think we've had particular problems with health boards. Um, so that's something that um, I will try and raise this for the committee and get an answer back to the committees as soon as possible. Thank you. Uh, the sixth competition is PE 1446 by Dr Liza Morton on behalf of the Scottish Adult Congenital Heart Patients on Scottish standards for the care uh, of adult congenital heart patients. Members of a note by the clerk and the submissions. Um, again, I, I think this is a very good petition. I think it's quite important that we you know, write to the Scottish Government about this petition in some detail. Um, but are mem do members um, have any other contributions they want to add about the next steps for this petition? Uh, Jackson Carlo? Uh, in so far as convener, I mean, this does look as, <laughs> with reference to our last petition, as if, uh, that we, from which we took evidence, as if considerable work is being done in the NHS in England. But it also doesn't look as if there seems to be any imperative operating to draw it to a conclusion or to expedite it. So I think in uh, writing to the Scottish Government, who I think to some extent are plugged into that process and awaiting the outcome, it might be helpful if we invited them to maybe seek to clarify what the status of that work is and when they would expect something 
to come forward from it, because I would say most of the other evidence that we have read is highly supportive of the issues raised by the petitioner. Uh, and I think that um, there's no reason I can see, I, I actually don't think the evidence that is going to emerge from England is going to be such that it would compel us to move in a different direction, um, to hesitate before Scotland gets on with doing something a bit more effective. Okay, thank you for that. Adam Ingram? Yes, um, uh, I was very interested in the submissions that uh, were presented, particularly from the, the Golden Jubilee National Hospital, which takes the lead um, in the Scottish uh, Adult Congenital Cardiac Service. Quite a mouthful. But, um, it uh, appears that there has been a, a, a lot of work going on and there is a new strategy being put in place. Uh, and if I can quote from somewhere, this, uh, there's a new clinical network that's to be launched early this year. And uh, the, the, the first task for the adult subgroup of the network will be to look at standards appropriate for the Scottish service, which is what the petition is calling for. So it would be good to get an update on where we are with all of this um, uh, convener. And, and hopefully the, 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 the progress has been made without necessarily waiting on what's happening down south. Okay. Just to say again, I actually thought the, the Scottish Government response was quite offensive. Um, and its conclusion that what are your views and what the petition seeks, the Scottish Government awaits with interest the outcome of the public petition's consideration of the petition. I thought, I, I thought was kind of a rather circular, uh, a circular response. I think our consideration is that something should be being done. And I mean, it may be that uh, Adam Ingram is correct that there are stands, but I'm, in a sense, I'm slightly surprised the Scottish Government wasn't slightly more alert to those in the response that it itself made. So I, all of that doesn't really fill me with the confidence of a great impetus, despite what I'm reading in various submissions. We're, of course, very happy to write the Scottish Government health policy for them, but I suspect they wouldn't want my fatal influence in that. But, uh, yeah. Can I just, just uh, I'll add to, to uh, Adam Ingram's point? I think one, one of the questions we raised was uh, with this particular problem that, that if a patient has to have treatment other than where they normally have, uh, have treatment, there, there's no record. That, and I think the network must have some form of uh, I don't know how we couch this, but some meaningful uh, database which can you know, so that, so that the paperwork follows the patient yeah. instead of us uh, not treating people appropriately. Okay, does any other member have any other view? Term? So it was agreed then we're going to continue the petition in terms of the points raised by the members of the committee. And ju just for the record, could it also confirm our general policy? and this is not to take away anything from the petition, uh, that we don't, as a committee, accept confidential papers. The reason for that is that we want all the paperwork to be open and transparent, mm -hmm. and I also feel that um, it sometimes causes difficulties with any FOI requests if we, if we do that. So our members agreeable to that as our continued policy, which would apply to all petitions before us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, other, other than, of course, if there's very exceptional items, in which case, obviously, I'll raise that with committee members uh, before it happens. Thank you. Uh, the seventh and final current petition is PE1455 by James McFarlane on public access to court records. Members have a note by the clerk and the submissions. Um, again, and there appears to be a bit of a theme here today, is we haven't had the substantial evidence from the Law Society of Scotland, who are clearly a very important um, body. Um, in fairness, I think all the other evidence we find has pretty much gone in one direction. Um, but just for completeness, I would prefer to get the Law Society's view and then make a decision at that point. Would that be agreeable to members? Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and as agreed in Agenda Item 1, the committee will now go into private session for the final Agenda Item of today's uh, meeting. Um, and I will also suspend just for one minute uh, before we start the next part of the uh, business. If members want to get coffee or tea. Yeah. Right.